Hello, and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Off Demystified podcast. Today, we're joined by Brian Grothstein, who is currently running revenue, enablement, and operations at Instawork, but has a pretty extensive sales management, and I just recently discovered a very operations and enablement-focused background from companies such as MindBody. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. And so I actually first want to kick off with something you mentioned before we just went live. Um, we were just chatting about Brian's background and that it seems that, well, from LinkedIn anyway, that a large part of Brian's experience was sales and sales management, not operations, but you used an interesting phrase. You said actually those roles were more of a band aid where you were actually doing enablement and operations. So please share more. Yeah. So um, being in in sales enablement and operations, you actually get to understand like at a much more intimate level, the expectations of senior leadership around, you know, go to market strategy, execution um, and, you know, quota attainment. So um, in doing so, you know, whenever there's a gap, uh, someone has left the business from a leadership position, um, or there's a new office being opened and they need someone to be the stand in and ramp up team members, ramp up teams as a whole. Um, I've often been tapped on the shoulder and said, Hey, can you, can you fill this gap for anywhere from a month to a full quarter? Uh, and it, it really does help you hone your craft in ops and enablement having to carry the quota and having to lead the team yourself. Got it. Okay. And so uh, at what point would you say that you officially then moved in to operations? It's, it's an interesting question. Um, and I've, a, a few of your past guests have kind of uh, alluded to this is that, you know, sales operations, relatively speaking, is kind of a uh, new nomenclature. You know, when I started um, in my first sales organization, it was uh, at Groupon way back in the day before it was a household name. And I started in in the sales org, but focused on enablement and operations. Sales ops didn't necessarily exist. So that was way back in 2009, 2010. And um, there was only a few of us doing the enablement function and some of the operational functions. And uh, that team grew from like, I think three of us to about 25 to 30 in a very short period of time because of how much the company was growing. So um, I guess technically that was my first enablement and ops role. Um, but throughout my career, I've rolled up and, and done the same job, but rolled up in terms of the kind of business unit to uh, sales, uh, sales operations, um, been kind of like my own kind of rogue, uh, independent uh, team um, in and of itself as well. Cool. I mean, that must have been an incredible experience growing with the sales team at Groupon. I've heard that uh, the growth was just insane. Yeah, astronomical. You know, we were um, hiring, I think, anywhere between uh, 20 to 35 new go-to-market team members every two weeks um, for, I don't know, two years, two plus years. And, at, you know, it was a little bit of a churn and burn mentality. We were bringing people in um, at, at such a massive scale and at a, such a fast pace that we knew the attrition rate was going to be um, pretty substantive. Um, but it was just a matter of, of, of getting the teams ramped as quickly as possible. Got it. Um, in the work currently, how many people are in the ops team and how many reps are you currently responsible for? Uh, the, the, the enablement and ops function is basically like me and a sales ops manager. Um, he doesn't report to me, um, which I think is interesting. And, and I don't report to him. Like we have this really duality of purpose in terms of, you know, collaborating on the, the strategy for quota, comp, territory management, lead distribution, um, sales process implementation, sales playbook creation, all of those things is kind of a, a collaboration between the two of us as we, and, and we roll up to our, our VP of sales. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, and then just the number of sales reps as well. 
Yeah. So the, the number of sales reps that we support has um, is, is kind of evolved um, as a result of, you know, the current economic climate. Um, but prior to some of the furloughs and layoffs um, was around 40, 45. God, I'd say two. It is, is a really big change for me um, going from supporting a, a global go-to-market team of you know, several hundred, you know, five, 600, uh, SDRs, sales, you know, mid-market enterprise, uh, and CS to this, uh, you have to definitely change how you operate as a, as, as a, as a professional in this role. So was that something when, that you were looking for when you switched roles? Were you looking to kind of go a bit smaller to, I guess, have a more hands-on relationship with the reps or, did that was that criteria when you changed roles? You know what? I, I, it wasn't a criteria. What I was really looking for was uh, to go go back to building. Um, there, there's a difference between for me building and maintaining. You know, whenever I talk to anybody about like what you know what I do, what do I enjoy, what is my specialty, um, I would say that it's it's largely been going into an organization regardless of size and you know looking at what currently exists and and in, for the most part it, it was minimal at best in terms of like best practices for uh, sales enablement and operations. And we, in collaboration with a lot of cross-functional teams, go in and build something largely from scratch. Um, as I mentioned at Groupon, there were, you know, three of us pretty much focused on just like instructor-led uh, development and building playbooks around uh, our, our outreach. And then moving over to MindBody, at MindBody, uh, it was a much more mature company, uh, much more established, uh, recently publicly traded um, when I joined. And they had a lot of best practices in place, but um, it took, you know, one of your previous guests, uh, the amazing Brandon Roberts, uh, took ownership of the sales operations function. He reported up to one of the most remarkable sales ops leaders I've ever uh, interacted with and ever worked for, um, Hillary Headley. She runs sales operations at Zoom right now um, and really made it much more sophisticated, much more complex, and much more within kind of an industry standard. The current sales tech stack at the current, the current company. Yeah. Instawork. Yeah. So Instawork, um, we, I've used Salesforce throughout my entire career, everywhere I've gone, including Instawork. Um, and uh, LMS wise, sales hood has been something that I have of become accustomed to utilizing and, and implemented wherever I've gone. Um, super cool integrations with Salesforce. And that's one thing that I often look for whenever I'm implementing something or, or shopping for something that's going to be influential and effective at the business is does it have an, uh, a Salesforce API? Um, then Gong um, has been pivotal um, and instrumental into the upskilling of our team and a huge enablement tool. And then, you know, you run across the board uh, with other things like data visualization tools like Chartio. Um, it really, really helps us get a better understanding of our conversion rates. Um, trying to think of what else. It's kind of like the, the core of them, but we, we, I really love outreach. Um, so uh, there are tools across the board that do similar things, but outreach has been, has been um, effective for me at both MindBody and at Instawork. And I love other things like, you know, Vidyard, um, Thanks, um, or Sendoso is another one. I haven't used Sendoso, but Thanks is a simpler version. Zoom Info um, for data enrichment. And uh, LinkedIn Sales Navigator has been great as well. Awesome. Yeah, pretty comprehensive. What if the, would you say, since you've been at InfoWorks, has been the number one kind of increase in sales rep productivity thing that you or your, your colleague has done? I would say the, the things that we do to, to, to often build productivity um, is building playbooks. Um, Having an established, defined, and well-executed playbook um, is just so comprehensive, and it, it encompasses 
everything that you can think of that makes sales ops great, the science of sales operations. It's looking at benchmarks, uh, conversion, looking at, you know, uh, best practices. And it, I, I think that the best playbooks are often peer driven. So it's not just about what the data says. It's about how can you get your frontline management team and your top performers to endorse and advocate for the way by which they're successful. And, um, I think that those playbooks that you can hand to somebody during a new hire experience, you can get reinforced through a mentorship program that you've implemented uh, that allows you know them to kind of adopt the concepts and adapt them to their own, their own style. Over the past few weeks, we've spoken to a hundred sales leaders around the world to understand the impact of COVID-19 on revenue. And we've combined these insights into one single report that covers the immediate impact the commercial outlook, the tech stack that you need, and actionable advice for sales leaders. You can claim this whole report completely for free if you go to ebster.com forward slash COVID. That's ebster.com forward slash COVID. So when you say peer-driven, you mean that part of the content is not created top down by you guys, but it's also created by the reps themselves. Yeah. And, and not just, not just created, um, but, you know, making sure that the, the people that are at the top of the stack rankings are involved in the communication and reinforcement of those sales plays. Um, because we can use data-driven decisions. Um, we can substantiate it with graphs and, and, and all of these really amazing scientific solutions, but sometimes that just doesn't resonate. And, what I found to be the thing that is the tipping point for success and particularly sales new hires, because that's where I've like focused a lot of my attention um, over the years is the people that are the most successful, the fastest that they have the fastest rapid proficiency are resourceful enough to reach out to the top performers and say, what is it that makes you the most successful? So in observing that, I realized that no matter what we tell people, from top down, no matter what we try to um, be, you know, autocrats and say, you have to do this. Or if we have to say like, this is what the best people are doing. It doesn't resonate as much as, you know, if Tom is number one on the leaderboard and says, here's what I do to make a $10,000 commission check. Here's what I do to make 150% to goal. When he says that it resonates immediately and it's put into practice. Totally agree. Um, it's almost like a diff, it's like it's a different shift for sales operation. It's less like, as you said, the autocratic dictator, the more the facilitator of the brilliance and the communication between the reps. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's where the dynamic between sales, traditional sales operations by definition, where you talk about the people that are, you know, uh, Salesforce administrators and they're putting together, you know, a lot of the process and policy. And then that relationship with enablement that is packaging a lot of that material and delivering it to the individual contributor or the, or the leader that's going to need to do it on a day to day basis, right? Yeah, I haven't heard that distinction between ops, kind of classic ops and enablement like that. Um, you, you mentioned just now about some, some changes you guys have been making with the recent times. Um, I assume that, that you still have sales reps and that you're, you may be working more remotely. How has the way you work with the reps changed since that happened? Yeah. Um it's, it's kind of business as usual. Like I hate to say it like that because it's a trivialization of how much the world has changed. But, um, you know, we had a distributed workforce anyway, we had inside sales, you know, a group in San Francisco, a group in Phoenix that all did a traditional kind of outbound, um, inside sales motion. Um, but we also have people in market, we have small kind of, we work spaces in major metropolitan cities across the country. And, you, you, you have to hone that craft regardless of, you know, the, the current economic climate and you just have to go kind of all in on it um, given the circumstances. So it's, I, I just like to say that it's constant contact, right? If you're not going to see somebody face to face every day, it's, 
using all of the available communication tools, going back to the tech stack, you know, and, and using um, Slack um, has been a really, really important tool for our, our teams to stay in communication with each other, um, for us to have like automated uh, integrations with our own internal tools that make sure everyone knows what's going on um, with a customer or with a prospect. Has there been any any of the sales tools you mentioned in the tech stack that have come into their own since you've been working more remotely with reps? Um, come into their own. I don't think that the dynamic of the tools have changed. Um, we've maybe become a little more reliant on them. And I think to a certain degree, a little bit of a crutch too. You know, I was thinking about this the other day is that while the level of sophistication and complexity of sales has grown substantially over the years um, and the reliance, justifiable, but reliance on, on technology to optimize um, has been amazing, but that also has a little bit of a pitfall. Um, you know, we say this as sales leaders as that there, nothing will replace picking up the phone and talking to someone, right? You can be great at LinkedIn. You can be great at social media. You can be great at emails, texting, right? But ultimately it's about having good conversations. And I believe the same to be true about leading a sales team. Um, and while I can exchange 50 Slack messages in 30 seconds, um, or do the same things via email and a variety of other, you know, technology tools, I, I, I really prefer to just pick up the phone and chat. Nice. That's, that's a lovely note. Um, Brian, if you could only track one more sales metric or one single sales metric for the rest of your career, which would you choose? Um, so I would say the DM contact to, to set. So the conversion rate from the time that we speak to a decision maker to actually setting a, an appointment, I think is one of the most pivotal and often kind of trivialized or overlooked. Interesting. So you're saying that this, this metric is either not measured or those who do measure it don't realize its importance. Yeah. yeah. Because you're saying that if the deal is much more likely to close, if that time is below two days. Yeah. I mean, you, you hear in a lot of sales methodologies like Sandler um, and, and a few of the more com like complex psychologically driven um, approaches is that your first impressions matter a lot, right? I don't want to say most, but they matter a lot. And the emphasis on qualifying, right? And getting a, a sales qualified prospect to agree to a set is I think the, one of the most important skill sets because um, once you get into the actual appointment itself and you're able to have a solid discovery conversation, that's not really a KPI, right? Going from a, a, a held to a close, there's so many variables. And that's why Gong and Chorus and, and some of those um, tools are, are, are really helpful and like really getting into the weeds and understanding the right vernacular that you're using, the right questions that you need to say. Um, but that, that initial conversation that is first impression, that is driving your ICP, your value proposition, your engaging question, your qualification, all of those things in the initial conversation, I think are, are going to show you either you're setting or you're not. It's interesting. Are you, are you then measuring this for each sales rep and then coaching them based on this? Absolutely. So we do a weekly meeting with sales leadership where we look at each individual team member and we look at the DM contact. Sorry, I think I lost the audio. So the, uh, the, what we do is every week we meet with the sales leadership and uh, we look at each individual team member and their number of touches to DM contact, DM contact to set, set to held and held to closed one. So each one of those conversion percentages is benchmarked and whether you're falling above or below, 
relative to the benchmark or week after week, right? So you're, you're racing against yourself and, and trying to improve your conversions. And we coach accordingly. We create uh, learning paths from an enablement perspective that help coach to better behaviors uh, or better skills that are going to make you improve that KPI. Quite a scientific approach. Final question, Brian. Who in the world of sales operations has inspired you or taught you the most? You know, I, I think just being a part of the, the, the mind-body engine was extremely inspirational. Um, so many cross-functional team members and leaders that taught me things, many things, each one of them. Um, the one I already mentioned, uh, I, I, you know, I, was, I had the privilege of being a part of her team for about a year or so. Um, Hillary Hadley, she runs sales operations at Zoom right now, and she, she's brilliant. Um, and really defined the science of sales for me, um, for that, for that year. And I thought I knew a lot, but realized I didn't when, <laughs> um, I started to interact with her on a daily basis. It was really remarkable. Awesome. Well, I've got a page of notes here. Let me pick out a couple of things that I thought were particularly interesting. Um, I think the number one thing is the focus on playbooks and the two things. One is actually documentation documenting what is the best practice, but then B, having reps contribute to that and influence other people to, to play along with the playbook. Um, and then the other thing I have here is the distinction between enablement and operations and how that maybe the typical view of sales operations like the Salesforce admin is, is more of the top down, but enablement is more working with the reps to, to help them develop. Um, and then the metric was really interesting. Like it was quite scientific and I love the way how like, how I guess sharp you are with the metric with every rep, it, like and intensely focused on these different points, tracking them all month on month, month against each other and against themselves. So Brian, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it.